Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Squeezing Unity. If you are in this room looking for a nap, you are probably in the wrong place. For the next hour, we are going to have a speed run through the world of performance and how it relates to Unity. I do want to say a few things before I start. Uh, and the first one is, I am going to post these slides online later. In fact, I have had to cut so much material, so many examples, uh, for some of the performance uh, metrics that I'm going to show you, that I will have to post the full unredacted version online, which includes a lot more background information than I will be able to present in the next hour. OK, so hello. Welcome. My name is Ian. I am a developer relations engineer with Unity's enterprise support team. What that means is that I visit our enterprise customers and I help them solve problems, whatever those problems may be. As you may have guessed from the topic of this talk, they're mostly performance problems. People have a game. They've written some code. The way their code works and the way Unity works do not necessarily align. And so I come in. I try to make some, find some way to make these two things play together nicely. Now, you'll note there's not just one name up on, these, on this slide. Unfortunately, my colleague Mark could not be here today. Uh, so I've had to take over his half of the talk. Uh, you know, I've only had a few days to practice his slides. So if I stutter a little bit, if I halt a little bit, please bear with me. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Of course, we're going to talk about performance, but that's a very broad area. As with most of my performance talks, this is going to be something of a grab bag. Now, my original agenda when I first conceived of this talk was as so. I was going to talk about a bunch of Unity APIs that may do things you do not intend them to do when you're calling them. We'll then go and talk about various ways to use C Sharp's built-in data structures and to misuse them. Then we're going to have an add-on to a, a topic I talked about last year, um, inlining functions, in order to eliminate method call overhead. Then after that, I was originally going to talk about the real ways to squeeze performance out of C Sharp, the ways that you can get an extra three or four nanoseconds out of your Boolean comparisons. But when I actually finished building the material, it really looked more like code golf. I was just doing it to show off, and it wasn't really going to help anyone in the real world. Instead, I looked at the Unite schedule and I realized that the top creator of performance problems in Unity projects was not going to be discussed. So I'm sorry for the bait and switch, but we'll be finishing with Unity UI. OK, this is a reminder. We're all professionals here. But please, when we're talking about performance, I am going to issue a lot of things that sound like hard recommendations, the way that you should always do it this way. But please remember that you should make your game work first and you should make your game fun before you try to make it fast. A lot of the things that I'm going to tell you to do will introduce additional complexity. Additional complexity means higher maintenance overhead and the possibility for more bugs. So profile your code, profile your game first before you begin applying this advice. OK, let's go right into it. We're going to start with Unity APIs that do things you may not intend, Unity APIs you can't necessarily trust. And the system I'm going to start with is one that's not often discussed when talking about scripting performance. We're going to talk about the particle system. You see, in Unity 5, uh, when you call one of the particle system's main APIs, like start or stop, or even the simple is alive check, it iterates recursively by default through all the, ch the children in the particle system's hierarchy. Now, it doesn't do this in any particularly intelligent way. It actually goes to the particle system, finds all the children of that particle system's transform, calls get component on every single one of those transforms, and if, if there is a particle system, yes, it then invokes the appropriate stop start is alive method. But if those child transforms have their own children, it recurses into those as well. Now, if you have a particularly deep transform hierarchy, this can definitely become a problem. So what can you do? Well, all these APIs have a with children parameter. It defaults to true. Set it to false. It eliminates this behavior. It will only change the particle system that you're calling directly. Now, it's common for VFX artists to create um, particle systems or visual effects that have particle systems spread across several child transforms. So you may actually want to start and stop all of these at the same time. Apply the old standard Unity remedy to get component calls cache a list of them at initialization time, then call start or stop or is alive 
on each of those in turn and make sure to pass the, the false parameter, uh, false as the with children parameter. Now, there is one other thing about particle systems that might make you sad. Um, when we're working with Unity, we often want to drive down the number of times we allocate memory on the managed heap. We want to drive our GC allocs down to zero. There's a problem here. As of Unity 5.4, um, we introduced a little problem into a couple of the particle system APIs. If you call stop or you call simulate, we will allocate a small amount of memory. Yes, it doesn't matter if the particle system is already stopped, it's still going to allocate memory. Every time you call it, it will allocate. And this is because most Unity APIs, the ones that you use, are actually just C-sharp wrapper functions. Now, in particle systems case, they actually wrap some internal C-sharp functions, with then, which then do the actual work. The problem is, in 5.4 and all the way through 2017.1, we introduced a closure. And as all good C-sharp programmers know, when you close over a local variable, we must allocate a reference on the heap to keep track of it. We've talked to the particle system team about this, and this will be fixed. It is already fixed in 2017.2. But some of you may be close to shipping, and you can't wait that long. So let me give you a little hint. Remember how I said that those public APIs are just C-sharp wrapper functions around other C-sharp functions? Here's the internal ones. Here's the internal ones. All the internal APIs are conveniently named internal underscore and then the actual function that you wanted to call. So what you could do is you could either write an extension method or you could address them via reflection and cache the, the, uh, cache the reference to the function. And then you could call them yourself. If you want the function signatures, here they are. The, all the arguments to these functions are identical to the ones in the public API, except for the first, which is just a reference to the particle system you want to stop or to simulate. Again, these slides will be posted later if you want reference material. Let's talk about a classic one next, APIs that return arrays. Now, you may not be aware of this. You probably are. You may not be aware of this. But any time you access a Unity API or a Unity API property that returns an array, it's going to allocate a fresh copy of that array every single time you access it or every single time you call it. This is primarily for safety reasons. If you have one system that accesses an array, modifies it somehow for its own use, we don't want some other system elsewhere to get an incorrect view of what Unity's internal, internal state is. Canonical examples of this, mesh.vertices. Access that, you'll get a fresh copy of the mesh's vertices. Input touches, you'll get an array containing all the touches uh, currently down in your frame. So if you are using these APIs, minimize the calls to them. There are, however, many Unity APIs that now have non-allocating versions. And of course, it's better to allocate nothing than it is to allocate a small amount. So with input.touches, there's, of course, input get touch, input.touchCount. For all the physics and physics 2D cast alls, so that's ray cast all, sphere cast all, box cast all. We now have ray cast all non-alloc, box cast all non-alloc, and so on. Uh, these have existed since 5.3. Similarly, if you do use get components or get components in children at runtime, there are now versions which accept a generic templated list. And it will fill up that list with the results of the get components call. Now, this is not purely non-allocating. If the results of get components exceeds the capacity of the list, the list will be resized. But if you're reusing the list, if you're recycling the list or pooling it somehow, then at least the frequency of allocations will drop as your application's lifetime continues. Now for my favorite one, camera.main, which looks innocuous. I hear a lot of laughter. Some people already know the punchline. Every time you call camera.main, it is not a direct reference to the main camera. We're actually calling uh, object.findobject with tag every time you access this property. Remember this one, because I'm actually going to come back to it in a little while. OK, let's talk about data structures. So uh, it is key to know how C-sharp's data structures work internally, so that you can pick the correct one to, achieve, to, uh, to accomplish the goals of the algorithm or game system that you are writing. Often, though, I find people picking data structures that are convenient to use rather than the ones that have the performance characteristics that align with their goals. So let's have a quick review. If you have a list, internally it's just an array. 
And if you are randomly indexing into an array or a list, or you are iterating through an array or a list, that's effectively going to happen in constant time. There's very, very low overhead. So if you're iterating through a list of things every frame, list, array. On the other hand, if you need to have constant time addition or removal, you may want to use a dictionary or a hash set. These are backed by a hash table. A hash table has some number of buckets. Each bucket has a hash value, which, co comes, from the, which is, comes from the hash code of the objects passed to it. And it stores the objects with the matching hash code in that bucket. The bucket itself is basically just a list. So adding and removing the things from there is close to constant time, depending on the capacity of your hash table and the number of items you're inserting into it. If you're actually relating data in a key value manner, you're saying this piece of data is related to this other piece of data in a one-way manner, you probably want to use a dictionary, because you're probably trying to look up that other data by your, by your key data. In that case, that's what a dictionary does. But I often find people misusing dictionaries. If you're trying to simply relate two pieces of data, saying there is a relation between data A and data B, but you want to iterate between that, over that data, it, data of relation every frame. Often, people use a dictionary because it's expedient. It already has a, a pairwise relationship between two objects. The problem is you're iterating over a hash table. When you iterate over a hash table, we must iterate over every single bucket in that hash table, whether or not it's full. So there is considerable overhead in iterating over a dictionary. Instead, consider creating a structure or a tuple and storing a list or array of those structures or tuples that contain your data relations. Much faster to iterate over every frame. Now, it is not always as cut and dry as this. I realize that. Sometimes you have multiple concerns. Let's consider a very common case. Something I discussed last year was the update manager pattern. This is where you write a system that distributes update callbacks to different systems inside of your game and systems can subscribe to receive updates when they want them. So what are our requirements? Well, because we, can, we are conceivably updating th many, many systems, and because we are updating them every frame, we want our overhead to be low. We don't want our update manager itself to become a performance problem. At the same time, because we can at any point subscribe to updates from another system, we effectively want constant time insertion. We want to be able to add things to our update manager without mu much overhead. Finally, we don't want to allow systems to subscribe twice. That could cause unintended bugs elsewhere in our game. A character might run twice as fast, for example. So we need to be able to perform duplication checks. We don't want that to take too long either. So if we examine each of these requirements, we can see that there's no single data structure that actually meets all of them. If we want iteration, low overhead iteration, we want an array or list, and so on. If we want constant time insertion, yes, we could also use an array or a list, as long as we make sure to insert at the end. We could perform some tricks to do, have constant time removal by swapping items from the end into the position of the removed item. But the duplication checks we cannot resolve unless we sort the array or list. So we effectively need to use a dictionary or a hash set if we want to have quick uh, duplication checks. What's the answer here? Don't just use one data structure, use two. Maintain both. Maintain a list or an array for iteration. But before you change the list, use a hash set or some other kind of indexing set to perform the check whether the item that you're adding or removing is actually present. The downside to this, of course, is that you are maintaining multiple data structures. So there's a, there's a higher cost to, to addition and removal, and there's more memory overhead. Now, you could also, uh, if you're using reference types, you could also use a linked list or an intrusively linked list uh, to represent your data. An intrusively linked list is where you take your data item and you actually add the previous and next links into the data item itself. So, that, so you're basically mixing the concerns of the list and the storage of data. A little bit dirty, but fairly common in video games. I don't have too much more time to describe that pattern, but Stack Overflow has several excellent articles. Another quick tip about dictionaries. Common thing I see is when people have some Unity engine content, some mono behaviors, some scriptable objects, they want to relate that mono behavior, that scriptable object, to some other piece of content. So they use a dictionary, and they use the mono behavior or the scriptable object as the key to that dictionary. This isn't a priori bad. Now what happens is if you use a Unity engine object, of which scriptable objects and mono behaviors are both derivatives, we use the default uh, dictionary compare by default. 
That calls the object.equals method. And when I say object, I mean the plain C sharp object equals method. Now, unityEngine.object overrides that method and forwards to another method called compare base objects. As long as you're not running in editor mode, that performs a bunch of additional checking. It makes sure that there's no, no nulls involved before, before calling some additional methods. And finally, in the end, it ends up in the C sharp space object reference equals method, which just checks that the two references you've passed it both point to the same thing, the same object. Now, that doesn't sound too expensive. It's just a few extra checks. But we've introduced a couple of extra branches to our equality checking. And that introduces a small amount of extra overhead. Hold that thought. I'm going to give you another piece of advice. Every Unity Engine object has an instance ID. I don't have too much time to go into what this is. But an instance ID is always unique. It is guaranteed to be unique. No two Unity Engine.objects during the lifetime of an application will have the same instance ID. And this instance ID never changes from when an object is created until that object is destroyed. And it is just an integer. You can access it by calling the getInstanceID method. Now, what, are, what am I going to be doing, telling you to do? Well, since it's invariant and since it never changes over the lifetime of an object, in your awake or on enable callbacks, you could call getInstanceID and store the instance ID on a public field or a public property. And then you could use that as the key into a dictionary. How does, that, uh, perf how does that compare in terms of performance? Again, because I'm telling you to do it, you can probably guess. But the degree is, is actually quite surprising. That cached int key version, where I actually grab the integer ID at initialization time and reuse it as my dictionary key over many, many iterations, is three times faster when indexing into a dictionary compared to using an object, regardless of the platform you're on. I used a very slow tablet and a very fast laptop. IL to CPP and mono, the results were effectively the same. The difference is, if I did not cache the instance ID, if I called get instance ID every time I wanted to index into my dictionary, on IL to CPP, I still re realized some performance benefit. It's still about 30% you know, faster than the object version. Under mono, though, it ends up being slower. The thing is, get instance ID actually invokes some unsafe code. So this seems to affect Mono's JIT compiler's ability to optimize my loop for me, whereas IL to CPP doesn't seem to care as much. Further, if you end up using the integer key dictionary, you're not using the default equality comparer anymore. Built-in types like float and int have dictionary, have dictionary, uh, have dictionary types in the standard C-sharp library that have been hand-optimized by the Xamarin team. That is handwritten IL doing your comparisons for you, which is going to be faster than using the default one. Now, don't do this all the time. This does introduce, again, some additional complexity. Reserve this for the dictionaries that you are accessing hundreds or thousands of times per frame. For example, if you're building a strategy game or an RPG, you may have some dictionaries containing your character's attributes that are keyed off of perhaps uh, a scriptable object. Well, in those cases, when you are indexing it to thousands of times per frame, this can shave a millisecond or more off of your frame time. I've seen this happen in the real world. OK. Next thing we're going to talk about, method call overhead. Sorry for the abrupt cut. OK, every time you call a method in C Sharp, there's a small amount of overhead involved. We have to maintain the stack. We have to push variables onto the stack, pop them back off when you exit the function. We have to jump the, the, the uh, instruction pointer around. Now. Normally, this is not much of a concern. The amount of time this costs is very, very small, usually measured in nanoseconds or milliseconds, or, or microseconds. Sorry. But most programming languages, if you come from a C or a C++ background, you know that there's a way around this. You can use the inline operator on your methods to get rid of it. And what inlining does is instruct the compiler to take your method body and effectively copy-paste it into the place where you're calling the methods. So, the easiest way to get rid of method call overhead is simply not to call a method in the first place. Hypothetically, this also works in C Sharp. The C Sharp JIT compiler should inline uh, trivial functions. In practice, when we measure this in Unity's C Sharp compiler, both the old one and the new one, it does not seem to occur. We still see performance penalties, regardless of, of whether we're inlining them or not, or whether we ask them to inline or not. So I ran a little test. I wrote a simple program, and what this program simply does is it iterates through a bunch of lines of text 
and tries to count the number of times it sees a specific input word in that text. The key function here is find number of instances per word. What I did is I passed in uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is 1,900 lines of poetry. That was enough to expose performance problems. So find number of instances of word. I'm not going to show you the method body. You can kind of guess how it works. The important part is at the top there, highlighted. There's a thing in C-sharp called the method implementation attribute. And this provides the compiler with hints at how, as to how it should treat your method when jitting it or when cross-compiling it with IL to CPP. Now, in this case, as a control, I have used the no inlining attribute. And what this does is, of course, instructs the compiler to not inline. Anytime I call this function, please make it an actual function call. But this is not the only thing you can do. If you're using the new 4.6.NET runtime, there is now an aggressive inlining attribute. And this is like attaching the inline keyword to your function in C or C++. This asks the compiler to copy-paste your function body in. And again, as a control, what I, I did what I call manual inlining, and what other people might call disgusting copy-paste. I simply put my method body into the middle of the method I was copying it. How does this perform? OK, in 3.5, with no inlining and with manual inlining, there's about a 10% performance benefit in this case. Depending on the size of your method, depending on how heavy the body of your method is, you'll re realize more or, or less performance benefits. There's a greater performance benefit for smaller methods. However, and the interesting thing is, this is actually relatively invariant between mono and IL to CPP. On the other hand, when we asked for aggressive inlining, in mono, we ca almost caught up with the manually inlined function. But when we cross-compiled it with IL to CPP, that performance benefit disappeared. Results, effectively, if you have some code that is in a very, very, very hot path and is, and is very trivial, consider manually inlining it if you're in the 3.5 runtime. This is a maintenance nightmare, so use this technique very sparingly. But I have seen this used in real-world game studios, and it has brought their computation times down significantly on the order of sometimes 10%. On the other hand, if you are fortunate enough to use the 4.6 experimental runtime, then you can use aggressive inlining and achieve almost all of the benefits of copying and pasting your code around with none of the maintenance headaches. On the other hand, I went and I asked the scripting team about these results. Spoiler alert, aggressive inlining is simply not yet implemented in IL to CPP. However, it is coming soon, TM. Um, actually, I, I do expect it to be quite soon. I don't have a specific release date to give you right now. Um, but please continue to check our, our patch release notes. It, they will be in there whenever it, get, whenever it comes out. There are other places where this sort of thing is relevant, though, where this method call overhead is relevant. If you create a trivial property, you know, the c sharpy way of, of declaring uh, a variable on a, on a class is often to create a property with just a public getter and a public setter. However, every time you get or set the value of this variable, you are, are actually invoking a method, at least under c, um, Unity's c -sharp compiler. So again, if there are variables they are using in the hot paths in your code, consider just converting them to public fields. There's no functional difference. There's no additional protection difference to your code, but it is actually more performant. OK, now we're going to pivot. I've just been talking about a lot of things where I've had to say, only in the hot path, only in the hot path. O test this first. Now I'm going to talk about something that affects pretty much every single project that I visit. It is one of the biggest causes of performance problems in Unity, and of course, that is Unity UI itself. So let's start with the basics. How does Unity UI work? The basic component of Unity UI is the canvas. The canvas owns the meshes that are, that are generated from the UI elements that you place on it. And it takes these meshes and submits them to the GPU for drawing. It actually issues the draw calls. It is also responsible for, for ordering the regeneration of those meshes whenever necessary. Now, generating those meshes can be quite expensive because we want to collect them into batches. And that is not cheap. So we want to do this as few times as possible. We only want to do it when something changes. The problem is something changes means when one or more things on your canvas change, when one or more UI elements are updated or otherwise changed. Yes, one UI element on your entire canvas can dirty it. And many people build their entire game's UI in one single canvas with th thousands and thousands of elements. They change one text property, and suddenly they have a five millisecond spike. This is why. 
Now, what's actually going on in that rebuild? What's so expensive? There's three different major steps. The first thing we do is we go to all of Unity's automatic layout systems, the vertical layout groups, horizontal layout groups. And if they're dirty, we tell them to rebuild their layouts, relay out the, their trialed items. The second thing we do is we go to every enabled graphical element on the canvas, every UI text, every UI image. And we ask it to regenerate its vertices. And yes, we do this for every enabled image. We don't look at the color property. We don't look at the rec transform's position. If you have moved things off screen, or if you have alpha them out to zero, they are still going to generate meshes. They are still going to be submitted to the GPU. If you have alpha out quads on screen, yes, you are still paying the sampling cost for them. Don't do that. The last thing we do is we regenerate the materials that we use to, to draw our UI. This is rel usually a relatively quick step. I'm not going to talk about it more, because I've never found it to be a, a cause of performance problems, which is a rare thing to say. Now, the thing is, while these systems all appear to be able to be dirtied individually, in practice, whenever we dirty one of them, we end up dirtying all of them. There are a few very notable exceptions. If you change the color of a graphic, we will only dirty its vertices. If you have a UI image and you change one of its fill properties, like fill amount or fill center, we will also only dirty its vertices. Now, after we've run those three systems, run those three updates, the canvas takes the meshes and materials that have been submitted by its UI elements, and it tries to divide them into batches. It wants to draw them in the least number of draw calls possible. Longtime Unity veterans will be familiar with this problem. You know, back in the, th the 3.5 days, we all struggled to get our draw calls down below 100, and UI was often one of the major sources of draw calls. So Unity UI was built to try to solve this problem for you by doing it automatically. So what it does is it takes the input set of meshes and it sorts them by depth. The reason for this is that all UI geometry is considered transparent. It is submitted to the GPU in the transparent queue, no matter what. If you have an alpha-less image, it doesn't matter. We're still going to consider it transparent. It's still going to be drawn back to front. So yes, if you have a lot of, of large stacked up greebles or, de or, or background decorations, those can cause significant overdraw problems. You can use the overdraw view in the editor's scene view to, uh, to actually diagnose this. Just look for those, those nice hot yellow areas in the scene view. And you'll note that I said it involves a sort by depth. Yes, this is a regular old sort operation, which has scales n log n with its input set. This means its performance drops faster as you add more and more things to the canvas. But worse, as you add more and more things to the canvas, it's also more likely that any given frame, one of those elements is going to get updated. So you're more likely to dirty your canvas. And by dirtying your canvas, you're spending more time rebuilding it. It's a vicious cycle. How do you solve this? I've hinted at it already. You use more canvases. Each canvas is an island. It isolates the things on that canvas from the things on other canvases. If you have UI elements on one canvas and UI elements on another canvas, the first canvas updates, the second canvas is still happy and will not regenerate its batches. This is the main tool you have for resolving batching problems with the Unity UI. Fortunately, you don't just have to use many different root canvases. You can nest canvases, which allows designers to create their nice big hierarchical UIs without having to think about where different things are on screen across many canvases. The other nice thing about this is that you still maintain that island characteristic. Child canvases isolate their contents from their parent canvases and their sibling canvases. They also inherit their parents' rendering settings, but can override some of them. And this can become important. So some quick general guidelines. If you have big canvases, divide them. But try to group things together based on when they get updated. If you have multiple elements that are updated at the same time, they will all have to be rebuilt in the same frame. So put them on one canvas. The general way you do this is you take things that aren't updating ever, they're only updated once when the canvas is shown, like a background element, some static text, static icons, put them on one static canvas. Then take the things that update frequently, you know, anything that your designers want to bounce and dance around, blink in and out, put those on a separate dynamic canvas. So that dynamic canvas will update every frame, but everything else will remain uh, pre-batched. As an example, I took Andy Touch's uh, inventory screen demo from his Unite Asia optimizing Unity UI project. As you can see, we just have some character statistics for Unity Chan, we have some descriptive text, and we have her inventory. And this was meant to simulate a late game scenario, so we have a scroll rect. 
The scroll rect has 1,000 entries, each entry having three graphical items. So we effectively have 3,000 different things that will need to be batched when we scroll that scroll rect. Anyone who has used a scroll rect with a large number of items knows what the next slide is. It takes way too dang long. It takes 25 milliseconds on a very high-end laptop, standalone, just to scroll that list. If you're on mobile, it's going to take more than 100 milliseconds. That's not acceptable. So what can we do? Well, the way we've built this UI, I've taken a rect transform, made it the parent of my scroll rect. This is important. I've made that, that parent of the scroll rect occupy the area of the screen that the scroll rect exists in, so that inventory outline with the background and the, and the heading, as well as the scroll rect itself, are inside one rect transform. Then I added a canvas to that rect transform. This means when I scroll the scroll rect, we're not rebuilding the other 100 or so elements on the outer canvas. But more importantly, I've also turned off pixel perfect. Designers usually want static UIs to be pixel perfect because they don't want any fuzziness on the text or on the icons. But when you're scrolling a list, you know, you're not going to be able to tell where something's a little bit fuzzy for a single frame. And turning off pixel perfect is actually one of the biggest performance gains you can make when you have dynamic content. In fact, just making this one change, isolating this sub canvas and turning off, pix turning off pixel perfect, brings our updates down to five milliseconds. There's a reason that only is in quotes, because if I were the programmer on this project, I would still not consider that acceptable. We would have to keep going further. We would have to optimize our scroll rect more. How would we do that? The first and most direct way, of course, would be to pool the elements that we have in the scroll rect, disable the ones that aren't visible somehow, either add new elements in at the bottom and remove them at the top, or enable and disable them as they enter or leave view. This will require custom code. The other thing you may want to do is add some code to clamp your scroll rect's velocity. Unity's scroll rect code right now does not aggressively clamp velocity. So when you scroll, if you have the inertia turned on and you flick your, your scroll rect to scroll, for several frames, often for two or three seconds after, you fin after the thing has finished apparently scrolling, it is still actually moving by about a hundredth or a thousandth of a pixel every frame. So it is still marking your canvas and dirty, as dirty, and you're still seeing that five milliseconds being taken up, even though nothing is changing apparently on screen. It's ugly. OK? Now I'm going to talk about the graphic raycaster. This is the component that translates your input into UI events. So it takes the mouse position on screen, takes the touch events from your screen, and translates them into things like mouse enter events, button click, uh, pointer click events, and so on. And it sends these events to the interested UI elements. UI elements on the canvas that are interested in receiving input. Do note that you require one of these on every canvas that, re that, re that requires input, even sub-canvases. So when I added that new canvas to my scroll rect, I had to also add a graphic raycaster to make sure I could still actually interact with it. Now, despite its name, the graphic raycaster is not really a raycaster. What it actually does is it takes the set of UI elements that are interested in receiving input on a given canvas, and it performs point rectangle intersection checks. It takes the input point on the screen, and it says, OK, is this inside the rectangle of this UI element? Is it inside my rect transform? If so, it dispatches the UI event and allows the, the element to handle it. And yes, this really is just a simple for loop. There's no intelligent code inside of here. Now, how do you know which UI elements are interested in receiving updates? That is the raycast, what the raycast target property does on UI text and UI images. So the first thing you can do is if you have some things that are not interactive, if you have some text on a button or some static icons on your UI, turn off raycast target. This directly shrinks the amount of work that your graphic raycaster must do every frame. Now, I did say the graphic raycaster isn't really a raycaster, but it kind of is. If you have world space canvases or camera space canvases, you know, screen space camera, then you can set a blocking mask, and the blocking mask instructs the raycaster whether you would like it to cast rays through 2D or 3D physical space. What this does is it takes the input screen point, constructs a ray from the origin point through the, the, the near clip plane of the camera all the way to the edge of the far clip plane, and it sees if anything in those physics worlds, the 2D or 3D physics worlds, intercepts the ray before it hits your, your UI. And it does that from the event camera. Event camera? That's this property, the event camera property on a world space canvas. Um, and on a screen space, uh, camera space canvas, it is actually the uh, render camera property. Now, we do yell at you if you don't set the render camera property on a camera space canvas. Uh, we get a big yellow warning box in the UI. But you can leave the world space canvases 
event camera blank. Now, what happens if we leave the World Space Canvas's event camera blank? We are going to use this in the graphic raycaster. We've got an event camera property that we access. Now, some people tend to believe that if you leave the event camera blank, that means your canvas is not interested in receiving events, so they don't set one up. Let me show you the event camera property. Look at the final line there. If we are on a world space canvas and we do not set the event camera property, we instead fetch camera.main. Dang it. Now, OK, I heard one, at least one face palm out in the audience. But you're probably thinking, OK, OK, that's bad. But it can't be that bad. They're probably caching the access they make to that property. Nope. Depending on the code path we take, we can ca access event camera between seven and 10 times per frame per graphic raycaster per world space canvas. <laughs> that is an excellent question. Why? And as a reminder, I think you've all remembered this, camera.main is find object with tag. Now here's the other thing. Fortunately, I know everyone in here shivers when they see find in a, in a function call from Unity. We all know that find object by type is not a good thing to be calling at runtime. Fortunately, find object with tag is not quite as bad as find object with type. We maintain an index of all the items that have tags in your scene, a special index, and we only iterate over that one when looking for tags. That said, many games end up using tags for design things, for QA things, for you know, describing gameplay, for de you know, determining who your players are, what your obstacles are. So it is very common to have thousands or more game objects that are tagged. So how does this perform? I created 10 world space canvases, and in one case, I left the, world space cam the event camera unassigned, and in another case, I assigned the event camera. Now, in the case where I assigned the event camera, there is no performance difference in the graphic raycaster when accessing the event camera property. No matter how many tagged objects you have, it doesn't matter. But performance degrades rapidly as the number of tagged objects increases. I'd say actually 1,000 objects, which in this case takes nearly a millisecond just to access the camera main property per frame, is low and is being run on a high-end laptop. If you were running this on an iPhone, this would be a much larger number, possibly as large as four or five milliseconds. Unacceptable. So what can you do? First, avoid using camera main. Cache the references to your cameras at initialization time, or at the very least, at the start of your update loop. Unity could, should also take this advice. And I know the, the lead UI programmer is sitting in the back somewhere. The other thing we can do is create a system to track which the main camera is. Now, we can't do this for you. We can't actually cache, the, cache this in between frames, because you can change what the main camera is at any given time. But if you have a complex camera setup, you could at least create some way to track your camera system and tell your code which camera is the one it should care about. Of course, this matters mostly in things that update every frame, but graphic raycasters do update every frame. So what can you do there? Always assign a world camera. Always, always, always. If you have to, write a mono behavior or some kind of code that will update the event camera property when the main camera changes. Do not leave this empty. <laughs> I want us to actually add a warning in the, UI, in the, in the uh, editor UI about this. The other thing you can do is if you have UIs that are not interactive, regardless of whether they're world space, screen space overlay, screen, screen space camera, don't add a graphic raycaster. It's just dire it direct you're directly reducing the amount of work Unity UI has to do every frame. And this is actually quite common. People often have world space UIs for like the health bars and names above their characters' heads. And by default, when they create these world space canvases, Unity adds a graphic raycaster. And they don't remove it, because they don't think it's going to be a problem. Get rid of that. Save yourself some time. OK. Let's move over to talking about layouts. The layout system. Now, many people are probably thinking, ah, I don't use Unity's layout system. I don't have to care about this section. No. It's not going to be that simple. So, Unity's layout system, like, like I, went, I said before, works on a sort of dirty flag. We tell a layout system that it is dirty when one or more of its child elements changes, which means whenever a child element changes, it must invalidate the layout system that owns it. The layout system, you'll note this terminology, the layout system is the set of contiguous layout groups that are directly above a layout element. Now, a layout element is not just the layout element component. UI images are layout elements. UI text are layout elements. 
scroll rects are layout elements, and also actually layout groups. You see, layout groups are just components too. You've seen these, vertical layout group, horizontal layout group, and so on. And they are always components that are directly parent game objects of layout elements. So how do the layout elements know which layout system they need to dirty, or if they need to dirty one at all? I could describe this to you, but I would rather give you a tour. We're going to go through the Unity UI source code. Now, you can download this online. I strongly recommend you do. It's a great way to find, um, find out why UI is behaving the way it does. The one we're going to start with is graphic.cs. This is the base graphic class, which is the parent of both UI text and UI image. So this, this class has a set layout dirty method, and it does what it says on the tin. It tries to dirty. It is called whenever we need to mark this layout element, or this graphic, have, we need to mark its layout system as dirty. The first thing you can see is that we have an early out. If our component is disabled, or if our game object is disabled, we don't actually try to mark the layout as dirty. This is important. Then we go into the layout rebuilder system, and we say, oh, here is my rec transform. This is the rec transform that is trying to dirty a layout system. Please mark my layout system as dirty. Well, that looks innocuous. It looks like it could be, could be built smartly. OK, let's go into that method. The mark layout for rebuild method, I've omitted the, the unimportant parts, takes the transform you pass it, and it begins walking up the hierarchy. So on the first parent, it says, is there a valid layout group here? And if, as long as there is a valid layout group, it continues walking up the hierarchy. It's trying to discover that contiguous set of valid layout groups that I mentioned earlier. And until it, it finds either a root transform or it finds no valid layout group, it continues this loop. Then it will break out and it will mark that root layout group as dirty, because it's the root layout group that is the master of the layout system. So we can immediately see that the number of times we are going to check for a valid layout group increases linearly as the depth of our consecutively nested layout groups increases. So if we have two layout groups, we're going to double the amount of, of valid layout calls. Three, uh, sorry, two layout groups will triple the amount of, of, of valid layout calls. Three layout groups will quadruple the number of valid layout calls. So what does that function do? Surely, it does something intelligent. Surely. Get components. We go to the transform we call get components and try to find all, any of the enabled layout groups on it. If there is one or more, we return true, and we've found a valid layout group. <sighs> now, how do we actually determine whether or not there is one or more valid enabled layout groups? Nervous laughter from the crowd. We have a link queue query that modifies a list. Link queue does not, does not belong in the hot path. List modification is also a linear time operation and does not belong in the hot path. Worse, everyone in here could think of a better way of doing this. We've got a list. We only care whether there's one enabled thing in it. Why don't we just iterate with a for loop through that list and, and early out at the first enabled layout group? Where's Phil? So what have we learned? First, even if you are not using the layout system, every U default Unity UI element that you use will try to dirty its layout, which will result in at least one get components call. And it will do this every time it tries to mark the layout as dirty. Remember, we don't cache that layout group, so we do not know if the layout group has already been marked dirty. We must do this every time. Further, as you begin nesting layout groups, the cost rises multiplicatively. Just adding one layout group doubles the amount of get component calls that we, that we perform. Two layout groups triples it, and so on. Now, what marks layout elements as dirty? On enable, on disable, both of them mark, mark, mark layout groups as dirty. This is usually the, the, uh, the cause of performance spikes when people are enabling or disabling Unity UI. They're, seeing, they're actually seeing the result of a massive number of, of, of UI components all walking up their hierarchy trying to mark layouts as dirty and calling get component dozens or hundreds of times. Similarly, if you reparent an active component, we have to dirty the layout of the old parent because we removed it from its set of, the set of things that it cares about, and we have to dirty the new parent because we've added something to the set of things that that layout group cares about. Further, if we, if we have a mechanism uh, applying any properties to our UI, we also mark the layouts as dirty. We actually also mark the vertices as dirty as well. And also, if we resize the rec transform, 
we change the size or the anchors of the rec transform, we also mark that layout as dirty. In fact, we mark the layout of all that, that rec transforms children as dirty as well. So everything dirties layouts, absolutely positively everything. There are very few exceptions. So let's have some solutions. Step one, avoid layout groups. Use anchors if you have to do proportional layouts. If you have to lay out two or three or four things side by side or vertically, you can set the anchors to say, OK, I occupy from the left side to 25% of my parents' width, 25% of my parents' height. Now, this is not, it's not always as cut and dry as this. I realize that. But as much as you can, use static layouts. If you have to have some kind of complex dynamic layout where things are being added or removed at runtime, try to write your own code to do this. You know how your game operates. You know when you're adding or removing something that will actually cause multiple components to have to, be, have to move around on screen or resize. So you could restrict updates to those cases. We can't do that. We aggressively dirty layouts. The other thing is if you're pooling UI objects, don't do it the naive way. Don't do it the way where people normally do it, where you reparent something and then disable it. Instead, disable it first. You will pay the cost of dirtying, dirtying that hierarchy once, but then when you reparent it, you will, not dirty the old you will not pay the cost of dirtying the old hierarchy a second time, and you will not dirty the new hierarchy at all. Similarly, if you're removing something from the pool, reparent it out of the pool first. Again, don't dirty the old hierarchy, don't dirty the new hierarchy. Then, when you're removing something from the pool, you're usually about to use it. So update all of your data first before you enable it, because each time you change a, you know, the UI text text, each time you change a, a sprite, an image's sprite, we are again going to mark the layout as dirty. So you can skip all of those mark layout as dirties by uh, updating it while it's disabled and then enabling it. You may also want to show or hide some UIs. You want to show or hide a particular canvas or subcanvas. What you can do is instead disable the canvas component itself. The canvas component will therefore not discard its vertex buffer. It will keep all of its meshes. It will keep all of its vertices. And when you re-enable it, it won't trigger a rebuild. It'll just start drawing them again. Also, because you're not enabling and disabling the game object that the, that the, the, uh, the canvas is attached to, we're not sending those on enable and on disable callbacks to your entire hierarchy. So you're, again, immediately skipping lots of get component calls. The main thing you have to be careful of when doing this is that if you have written some code that has in an update or a late update some kind of expensive operation, you will need to manually disable that whenever you enable or disable your canvas. You no longer get those, those convenient enable disable callbacks. And this can be become a bit of a, a maintenance headache. Now, in extreme cases, in really extreme cases, the source is open. You could rebuild Unity Engine UI from source and just strip out the layout system. This is a lot of work, because now your designers are going to want to add layout groups and have them function. Um, so you may end up having to write your own layout system. That's not going to be fun. OK. We're almost done. We're almost done up here. Last thing I'm going to talk about is animators. In all of Unity's tutorials, we, we, we show you how to animate your UI by adding an animator to it. In fact, if you actually have a, go, go into like the UI button uh, component and you say, oh, I want to, want to animate this UI component, it actually has a button for adding an animator. It says, oh, here's the four states. Just put your animations into these four states. That's fine. It puts empty animations into the states by default. Let me give you a quick tip. Remember that on did apply animation property, properties callback? It means that if you're thinking about using animators on UI, don't. Here's the reason. Animator was built to be performant. The animation system was built to be performant. And it was built kind of on the assumptions of character animation, which means the properties you're animating, it expects to basically change every frame. It's going to be interpolating between two keyframes. And if we had to introduce a branch for every, for, for every time we interpolated two keyframes and uh, on each property uh, to check whether or not it had changed, that would actually slow down the animator considerably. So, if you have any animation at all in the active state that you're animating or that you're blending to or from, then the animator will say, OK, well, I have to update these properties. It'll write those properties, no matter whether they've changed or not, fire the on did apply animation properties callback, and you will dirty your layout, even if, if nothing has apparently changed in your UI. Now, if you do have things that are always changing, like a little bouncing widget or something that your designer wants to put in, that's OK. You know, that's going to be changing every frame already. So it's not so bad to use an animator there. But if you have things that change rarely, or that only change in response, in response to events for a short period of time, write your own code. Use a coroutine. You know, you write your own tweening system or something. 
I, can, I guarantee you it would be a lot more efficient than using Unity's built-in animator. And that's all I have to say about that. OK. Um, we are effectively out of time. Thank you.